Hey, what's up everybody? It is Kellen here from Start Your Systems and welcome back to Monster Energy Supercross 3, the official video game where again today we're going to be recapping another edition of the Salt Lake City Supercross. These things just feel like they keep going and going and going. It's the Energizer, Energizer Bunny of Supercross right now. It's just non-stop Supercross, but uh, super excited about it because... I mean, I love Supercross. It's always exciting to talk about it. And uh, that's exactly what we're going to do for the third Salt Lake City today, which was round 13 of the series. And uh, this was a really good one. Um, if you guys have never been with us before when we do these videos, essentially I'm just going to be doing like a podcast for the next 25, 30 minutes where I talk about the race and uh, what happened in it and some things that um, I felt were interesting or cool and just some different opinions and stuff like that. And, uh, yeah, so spoiler alert, spoiler alert, if you guys don't want to hear the results or maybe you're still going to watch the race or something like that, I am going to be talking about the race, so it might spoil it for you, but just letting you know now that, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about the race. I built this track, which is supposed to be a replica of the track in-game, um, and I used the wet track version of it to play today, and as you can tell, it looks terrible. I don't know why the wet track on the custom tracks looks so bleh. Like this looks like just like this weird, I don't even know, like chocolate dirt. I, I don't know, like it, it just does not look like wet dirt to me. Um, but anyway, we're gonna try to make the best out of it and it just saps all momentum, which is just lovely. Um, but yeah, we could not get three more different nights of racing, I would say. Like in the end, the same top two finishers week after week have been happening, but the tracks have been so weird and so different. The first round was such a boring track, just nothing really crazy about it. And then it was super, super dry and the track got just really slippery and slick and blue grooved and stuff like that. And then Wednesday night, because it was a little bit cooler temperatures, obviously a night race, they were able to keep some moisture in the track this time. And I thought the track was one of the best tracks almost all year probably on uh wednesday night for the second round in salt lake city long set of whoops good layout of the track the the prep of it was amazing and stuff like that but then there's not much more you can do about mother nature unfortunately and mother nature uh showed up for salt lake city three it was pouring most of the weekend from what i gather um and eventually that led to a rain race essentially or a mud race if that's what you want to call it by sunday uh the rain basically stopped falling for uh the first heat races and stuff like that and it started really pretty much just raining at the beginning of the 250 main event and then it was kind of intermittent for the 450 main event but it was dry enough that all these guys were able to do some jumps and stuff like that so that's why i decided to use the wet version of the track today but let's talk about this crazy 450 main event which is one of the best races of the year, one of the best races it probably in the last decade or so, like this is going to be, I feel like, talked about for years with how good the battle was. Um, but, you know, Eli Tomac is going to win this championship, in my opinion. He won this main event again. He now has seven wins on the season. He just tied Ryan Dungey for third, no, third, sixth, right? Sixth? Sixth or seventh all time. Sixth all time, I believe, because he was seventh all time. Why did I think third? Thinking number three, Eli Tomac. Uh, sixth all time in Supercross with 34 wins. Of course, the glaring difference between the two of them is Eli Tomac has yet to win a Monster Energy Supercross championship, and Ryan Dungey won four of them. Um, but that is a different discussion for a different day. At least this year, Eli Tomac seems like he's about to stamp his name into the record books as a Supercross champion. So that is good news for him and everybody that's on his fan base. Um, but this actual race, which he didn't need to win, was insane. The, the track was very deteriorated. They, him and Cooper Webb had a titanic battle the entire main event this so last week i talked a little bit about guys laying over and how fitness is playing a big part in this championship and it's the truth like whether or not you believe ken roxon is fully telling the truth or if you're just you know probably an eli tomac fan and think he's coming up with more excuses um he's having breathing problems in salt lake city it happens jason anderson had this problem for years and you're going to say like, well, Garrett Marchbanks has asthma and he's doing just fine with it. But that's again, a different case. Like 
What we always have to, I think, feel like, remember about Ken Roxon that nobody seems to remember these days is when he broke his arm, he had 12 surgeries on his arm to get it fully repaired. They almost amputate, amputated his arm, so it's a miracle that he's basically racing uh, with us at this point anyway. But he had compartment syndrome with the arm, so he went through some real struggles with taking, um, uh, you know, medicine and different things to get his arm and everything back to full strength and it definitely affected his immune system and he had Epstein-Barr virus last year as well so there's a lot of things that were going against Roxon coming into this environment with quick successive races in a higher altitude and whether you believe he's telling the truth or not I, I'm just going to believe him for his word because he's had a pretty gnarly stretch of injuries and stuff like that that led to this situation in the first place but I think it's over. I don't think Roxon or Webb is going to win this championship anymore. There's four races to go. There's over a one race distance gap between Tomac and Roxon now. So it's over. Like, I'm sorry. Like, Tomac needs something very bad for, you know, him to lose this title. And if that's what it's going to take for him to lose this title, then he, like, that, like, that sucks. Like, Tomac deserves this title for where it is now. He's been the best rider this year. He's won seven races. He's going to win more races than anybody else in the class uh, will have won all year, except if Roxon wins the last four, then they'll tie on wins. But Tomac has, you know, got seven, and everybody else has three or less. So, again, I think Eli Tomac deserves it, but that's just me. Some people are going to think differently. But this race, again, like I said, doesn't need to win it. Everybody's too far down. Ken Roxon was lapped twice. He finished 10th in this main event. He was the closest guy in the championship. Eli Tomac saw that they lapped him twice, and he still went after the win, which is absolutely insane. But kudos to him because he's clearly trying to prove a point this year where it's like, I'm just going to put this thing away. I'm not going to wait until this mistake that I sometimes have happen uh, happens again. I'm just going to go ahead and win this championship and move on and forget about it and maybe that's the right move because in the past when he's played it a little bit safer or just tried to manage the championship perhaps it's come unglued a little bit so i think this year he's he's just hitting all of his marks properly and uh like i said he's gonna deserve it um but again okay so let's talk about this race because this was insane so the track was pretty deteriorated by the 450 main event there wasn't a lot of things uh, you would think that they could figure out to do differently that they weren't already doing. The rhythm lanes are pretty set in stone. Um, and this one, which I'm going to screw up because this tough block got in the way. They're essentially going over this and then doubling here and then going over this next table and then tripling out. And that was the line that they were doing all the way through the main event anyway. So there's nothing new there. But the difference was Webb and Tomac were both consistently and rather easily blitzing the whoops. They were by far the best in the whoops. Um, and then the other rhythm lane, which I'll get to in a minute, they completely took a different line that nobody had done all day long. Both of them figured it out. Tomac figured it out first, then he passed Webb, then Webb behind him figured out Tomac was doing it, so he figured it out. It was insane that two guys that had seen nobody do that thing all day long and nobody had tried it, what they were starting to do was doubling in right here, and I'm going to screw it up, but then they would triple, triple, and then triple into the corner, and nobody else was doing it except those guys. So it's mental enough that they were able to figure that out of the main event. But it was even crazier how much faster than everybody else they were going. On the last lap of the race, outside of Justin Barsha laying down a 54, uh, Tomac and Webb both did 53 second lap times, where the next closest besides Barsha was a 57, and most people were above one minute in lap time. That is how fast they were going that entire main event. That wasn't just the last lap. That was the whole main event. That's why they lapped all the way up to podium positions. They lapped Zag Osborne with two, three laps to go or something like that. Didn't get to Anderson, but Anderson ended up 40 some odd seconds behind them. They were absolutely ripping. And uh, this gets back to what I was talking about in my video last week, which I think I just mentioned at the beginning of this video, is that these guys, that they're, they're getting tired and it sucks as a fan, in my opinion, to watch a race where you can clearly see there are people that can run Eli Tomac's pace or run Cooper Webb's pace or whatever, but they don't have the stamina to do it. So they get past and they fold up like a broken lawn chair and just start looking behind them and going, where can I actually finish this race because I'm exhausted? And that sucks as a fan to watch that type of racing. So I wasn't really huge of everybody um, seemingly looks like they just like let 
a lot of these guys go by. But Webb was not of this mentality whatsoever, and I am here for it. I love every second of this type of racing because that's exactly what happened. Eli Tomac caught him early, passed him, started pulling away. Webb was like, no thank you, started putting in better lap times. Uh, now granted, Tomac did get a little bit of a hiccup. He got caught with a few lappers in some inopportune situations, but I think Webb was going to stick with him the whole main event regardless. He was clearly going fast enough to do it. He just uh, was losing touch with him a little bit there early on. Now, if he had lost a lot more touch, maybe he settles in for second, but it seemed like he wanted to go back after him for the lead, and eventually he would get him back for the lead, and then they would basically run nose to tail the rest of the main event from, I don't know, lap eight onward or so like that. So, um, terrific battle. In the end, it did come down a little bit to Lappers once again, kind of, I think, playing a part. Um, first of all, Lappers allowed uh, Tomac to get passed by Webb in the first place, and then Tomac passed Webb back in the whoops, and they were going, uh, you know, they split Roxon in the whoops one lap, and Webb was blitzing them better than Tomac a couple laps, and then Tomac would counter and blitz them better, and they just were like yo yoing back and forth this entire race. And then on the last lap, Webb was going into like hyperdrive web mode which he always seems to do like he, he passes ken roxon late in races all the time he passes dudes late in race all the time because he goes into this like next level mode that he has and he was on it again he was doing this ridiculous i, I don't know how but so in in this rhythm section here they were lapping roxon for the second time so they both kind of slowed down as they were double double doubling their way through and nobody all day long that i saw was able to go inside here in this corner and still bust this supercross triple and Webb did it like three times in the last three laps and like it was a big time saver comparatively to what Tomac was doing which was swinging wide there because he could still carry the same speed in and out of the corner as opposed to setting up for the triple in the first place like he was just making it all one fluid motion so he started running faster laps than Tomac with you know a couple laps to go and really put in a charge on that last lap and then uh, you know it's just it, it it is the way it is like people are gonna say oh those lappers are you know they suck we should have it so that they get you know eliminated from the race after they go two laps down or one lap down or whatever and then some people are gonna say lappers are part of the game they screwed tomac anyway this is part of it blah 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 and, and like that's you know both both opinions are whatever but the reality is the lappers did play a part in kind of ruining a good one-on-one -on -one battle to the checkered flag that we almost had. Like it would have been really, really cool in my opinion to see just that last lap with nobody else on the track. But we, you know, we don't get that, that's racing. Like sometimes lappers get in the way. I think Webb would have tried a pass attempt after the whoops, but he got blocked by Bowers a little bit. And to Tomac's credit, he went full send mode into the whoops. Like he, literally jumped into this corner and i don't think even like let off as he stood up through this turn and and just sent it into the whoops like i can't even do it in this game because he hit it so hard but um it was incredible the, the whole race was incredible that's the kind of racing i want to see every single week if you're if you're telling a new fan what kind of race should i watch that's the race i want to be able to show them and we don't get it every week and a lot of it i think comes down to fitness these guys have the pace to run an Eli Tomac lap time they don't have the pace to run 20 minutes of Eli Tomac's so that's the difference right now you know like Tomac has the speed all the way through but they just can't do it like he can and that's that's a huge difference maker I think you know like that's the same reason Carmichael won so many titles that's the same reason McGrath won so won so many titles like yada 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 these guys have the one lap speed they don't have the 20 minute fitness which again just as a fan is a bit of a bummer to watch but it's part of the game i get it i think eli has been exceptional this year in all facets of the game and uh, like i said four rounds to go full race distance lead could even clinch the title early but i think webb's gonna have something to say about that because it has been uh incredible and i think it actually shows a little bit of a testament i saw some people saying like oh you know tomac was gonna catch webb at the end of the main event on wednesday just you watch like he had him no problem like if they had two more laps, he's going to get him. But I don't know. I feel like this race pretty clearly showed that Webb is not going to lay over like some of those other guys. And that, to me, is is awesome. I am here for that every single day of the week. If you want to have those type of races up and down the block, I'll be here to watch. Like, it doesn't matter. 
that was incredible racing and uh you guys should be stoked on racing like that this shouldn't be like a uh web sucks tomac's the greatest or vice versa Th this should be about how good that damn race was because it was a damn good race such a good race um i'm gonna talk about this one for years i feel like anyway uh but yeah i'm bummed for roxon like clearly seems like whatever issues that he was talking about are pretty persistent and are holding him back because uh, you you don't go from finishing third at the opener to fifth at the second round to tenth this week just that you know quickly like it seems like there's something more going on than that uh and some people are gonna say oh he just gave up but i mean come on like he clearly is having more than just fitness problems i would say because fitness problems were not a persistent issue with him at the beginning of the season when he was podium consistently and winning races so i think there's just a little bit more to it now if it was fitness, I feel like I would call it because I think there are fitness problems with other riders. I'm just not, you know, they're not in the championship hunt, so there's no need to bring them up. But, yeah, that's just a bummer because it's kind of, you know, making this championship a bit of a snoozer down the stretch in the 450 class. But, again, like I said, great race up and down all the way. I am here for that up and down all around every week if we had races like that let's talk about the 250 class though because this is where things are going to start get really interesting uh coming in with a tie shane mcgrath had won the last two rounds he is now tied or was tied with chase sexton coming into this race sexton seemed like he was reeling a little bit starting to struggle with starts and uh, maybe just didn't have the exact pace that mcgrath had and clearly wanted to prove people wrong at this round, which, like, why not? You want to have the red plate back. You also want to prove that you can win these races no problem like you were. So, main event gets underway. It's pouring and rain. This is, like, the most rain we'd seen all day. And in the very first lap, two corners in, Garrett Marchbanks goes down pretty hard. And I haven't heard an update from him yet. Uh, people were asking what took the red flag so long. That's because Marchbanks was actually backboarded off the track. And like I said, I, I don't have an update on his condition yet. The only thing I can tell you is that, as you guys saw on TV, he was moving his legs. He was holding his lower back, but he was actually moving his legs. So it doesn't seem like it's, um, you know, one of those injuries. I, don't, I hate to say it, but I don't think it is. We'll have to see. Hopefully it's good news whenever he gets an MRI or CAT scan or any, any news back to us. But uh, right now, just uh, keeping him in my thoughts and hope he's doing okay. But it took him two laps to red flag it or so. And Marchbanks couldn't move. Like, they tried to pick him up, and he was, like, yelling at them, no, 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 don't pick me up. I can't. Like, this, is, this hurts like hell. And obviously it did because he had to get backboarded off. So serious situation needed to be red flagged but right before all that happened and i don't know if it contributed to it at all because it kind of held everybody up but in this corner right here mcarath gave sexton the business sexton had the start mcarath came down the inside shoved him off the track well really wasn't a shove like he barely touched him but i think just because of the way the ruts are formatted and everything like that that's why sexton went off the track it's very much like a what happened with fortner and ferrandis back at uh, San Diego and Oakland like where there was just slight contact but because of the circumstance of the track and where things are going and how ruts were formed he went off the track so I'm not saying it's McElrath's like fault and like it was a dirty move or anything like that it's just racing and then suddenly Sexton's off the track but he rejoined like two jumps later and he kind of jumped in in front of a lot of people and I don't think this is exactly what contributed to it but it did stack everybody up a little bit and eventually March Banks crashed at the end of the rhythm section there no idea what happened they have terrible camera angles all around I'm sure eventually we'll see some camera angles from pro circuit or something like that taking video of it um, but then the red flag came out and this is actually after at the at the end of the uh, next rhythm section after this rhythm section right here not this one but uh, they go to the supercross triple then there's another rhythm section on the far end of the stadium chase sexton had a big moment almost a really big big moment when enzo lopes in front of him in third at the time decided to double single into the corner but he landed like middle or kind of even like more left on the track like so he was he went over this table and then he doubled in here and then he's like let me jump to the far inside of the track and sexton was already tripling in behind him and he like landed on his rear fender and so i think th there, like there's two there's two wrongs there one is in traffic sexton tripled i mean I, I know he was trying to gain time so i i get it why he did it but 
Lopes landing middle slash left and going hard right is another problem I've always had with guys like early in the race. Like it's almost like they just forget there's anybody behind them. I know they're focused on racing forward, but I don't know. That's a little bit dodgy to try to do that in that circumstance, in my opinion. Like you got to have a little bit better situational awareness, in my opinion. Either way, they both got a mulligan because the race restarted because of the red flag from Marchbanks. And Sexton took advantage of it to start right behind McElrath. And who knows what would have happened because Sexton... Um, you know, maybe he thought that McElrath pushed him off the track on purpose. There was the whole Sexton pushed McElrath off the track in qualifying on Wednesday. And, Sex er, and McElrath said it's going to take a lot more than that to put me down and stuff like that. So maybe there was some more verba verbal drama and all this stuff brewing. But if you just take facts for facts, Sexton started second behind him and was catching McElrath at one point for the lead before McElrath had kind of like a weird brain fart when they were lapping Cody Shock. Now, lappers, again, were a problem all day long. I'm not going to, you know, absolve Cody Shock of any blame here. But he was trying to, like, just be a normal stay in a straight, narrow line kind of lapper. Like, he was sort of in the main line, but not really. And in, in this quarter here, Makarat just dove down the inside of him to try to make a pass, ran into him, and fell over himself. So it was kind of like a, huh? Like, what was what the heck was that all about kind of move? Um, and and that was all she wrote. Like, McElrath got up. It looked like his bars were bent. It took him a while to kind of find his groove again. Once he did, he was 20 seconds behind Sexton. And Sexton went on to kind of cruise to an easy win out front. So not as exciting of a race as the 450 division. But McElrath still finished second. There's only three points in it between them. And now they're going on to a break. There's going to be a week and a half break until the next race because they're not racing this Wednesday or the the coming Sunday. They're going to be racing the following Wednesday because this Wednesday and the coming Sunday are going to be West rounds. So these guys have to sit that sit on that and kind of, you know, chew on it a little bit. Sexton has the momentum swinging back his way going into this break if that's what you want to call it. And yeah, this championship battle's insane. Like 3 points in it, 2 rounds left to go. One of them is going to be a showdown. And now, McElrath has more help than Sexton has really on the track right now. Like, in the showdown, it's going to be a different story. But, you know, Sexton had Jeremy Martin to kind of help him, although Martin was useless in helping him, I guess, in a sense, for the Wednesday race. And people are going to say, oh, you can't do that. But, you know, like, Martin backed out of racing the rest of the season because he doesn't want to point out of um, 250 Supercross because that's how stupid these rules are because you can do that and it doesn't matter and Geico and he and the team and all of that stuff got together so he's out for the season for Supercross because he doesn't want to point out of the class but he finished third on Wednesday and Sexton finished fourth and like I feel like logic speaking there would be like why if Martin is not going to finish the season would he finish in front of his championship combatant teammate and I get it that's racing but seems a little weird that that's not something that was switched around because I think absolutely Star Yamaha was going to have team orders in order if Nichols tried to pass McElrath back or if he held the lead for too long out front or something like that. McElrath needs those points. Nichols not in the championship. Same kind of went for J-Mart, I would say. Uh, and now it's definitely proven to be the fact because he doesn't even care about this championship. But uh, yeah, like he doesn't have help now. Martin's not there. But Nichols still is, and Nichols is getting good starts, and he's running up front, and he's being a, a threat. And when we get back to the East swing in round 16, I'm curious to see if Nichols plays a part in this at all. Like, I don't think that's exactly how it's going to go down. It could just be between McGrath and Sexton. But if these star Yamahas keep getting really good starts, and the 16th round is going to be a pretty long start straight, I don't know, man. This, is, uh, this could be a bit of a factor here, just something to keep an eye on something I figured I should talk about now so that when we get to round 16 I've talked about it and I've already let in with it a little bit but uh, yeah these guys have that break and we're we're heading back to uh, West Coast Racing Ferrandis, Forkner, Cooper all these guys coming back to race this Wednesday going to be interesting to see like same stadium same venue different group of 250 riders uh, and it's not a showdown or anything like that so that'll be kind of weird but kind of exciting in the same sense and yeah, championship battle galore in this 250 class. I, I don't really know what to think anymore. I thought I was kind of more like on board with Sexton being the guy that was going to be tough to beat in this championship. And then McElrath clearly proved me wrong these last couple weeks. But 
he still in the end doesn't have the points lead like he he probably should to be fair like you know Marchbanks going down was really a negative thing for Makarath it's a negative thing for Marchbanks obviously but I'm saying like championship wise Makarath had a pretty big lead Sexton was having to fight forward through the field after that crash it wasn't looking good for him it was going to be another one of those races where got a start crashed etc whatever and Makarath started out front and was going away but in the end red flag comes out gets a mulligan and Sexton takes full advantage of it like those are those are championship kind of swings or winning ways that it happens like you even talk about um like going back to the 450 class last year when Michael Lessie and Cooper Webb ran into each other in a heat race I think it was in Denver um red flag comes out in that heat race as well you know just like circumstantial it's unfortunate for the riders that go down but it drastically helped Cooper Webb and I think in this case that absolutely helped Chase Sexton because I don't believe in the first main event Sexton was going to win that race um could have changed you know McElrath could have crashed by himself or something but I didn't think Sexton was going to win that race so in the end he gets the win third win of the season they both now have three wins there's still three points between them and this championship battle goes down to the final two rounds. I am excited for this one. Like the 450 class, as much of this championship is getting kind of broken up in the 450 class, it's getting gnarlier in the 250 class as the days go on. And as we head back to West Coast action, you know, I, I, I don't hope that anybody gets hurt, but I do hope for a little bit of chaos. Like I hope we have a showdown this year where two, uh, two 250 titles are fully on the line and these guys have to send it because um, that'll be a lot of fun and a good way to end this championship uh, in Salt Lake City. So anyway, 250 thoughts, 450 thoughts kind of across the board. Um, if you guys want any clarification on my thoughts in the comment section below or anything you'd like to argue with me about, I'm happy to do so. I know people like to uh, come in there and um, assert their fan boydom, which is totally fine. But uh, again, me, I'm just trying to be a very neutral party here and try to talk my way through some things that I saw and some things that I like or don't like and, and all these other things and tell you what man like this 250 championship I like that 450 race give me that 450 race on Wednesday I am all on board with that and spice up some 250 championship drama on Wednesday in the 250 West class I am all for that let's have another great night of racing here two days from now I can't believe we're going to be back racing again it just keeps on coming but uh, you know what that's awesome I'm glad that we're back racing Supercross and one week in Salt Lake City down, two more weeks to go, and four rounds of Supercross left to be run. Hope you guys are excited for it. I certainly am, and I really hope you guys enjoyed listening to my commentary here, recapping round 13 of Monster Energy Supercross. Want to give a, a quick plug here again. Uh, if you guys are interested in helping me out as a um, career path, I suppose, head over to racerxonline.com forward slash subscribe. Uh, 99 cents for three digital copies or 2.99 for three digital and print copies of the magazine right now great deal over there um, and uh, you can see some of the stuff that I write on the digital side or go to racerxonline.com and see some of the stuff I write over there uh, but you can also subscribe and help my paycheck come in the mail this week uh, so that I can you know get paid and continue to make these awesome videos for you guys where I recap the races and then uh, I go actually do this thing for my real job as well uh, but again, appreciate you guys stopping by. Hope you guys really enjoyed this recap because I am still catching my breath from that race. That was insane. And uh, yeah, on to Wednesday. So thanks again for stopping by, and I'll see you guys in the next one. So long for now.